Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some of which I grew up with and some of which are new to me. Today is one of the latter. Today we're looking at Octopus, which is a 2011 release for the Atari 8-bit, so a very modern um, production. It was developed by a guy who called himself Larrick, um, and a collective called Rsoft Corporation, and it was released as a public domain game. So you can just download this for free and uh, whack it on a flashcard for your real Atari 8-bit, or play it in an emulator if you choose to. Now, Octopus is one of several games developed by this group that are adaptations of classic Nintendo Game & Watch LCD handheld games that were popular in the early 80s. Octopus itself was first released in 1981, and it was the second of the widescreen Game & Watch releases. It came out in about July of 1981, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, for some reason it was uh, renamed twice when it was released in the UK. So it's also known as Mysteries of the Sea and Mysteries of the Deep. So if you're from the UK like I am, you may well have come across it under one of those names instead of its original Octopus. Now, like most Game & Watch games, uh, the gameplay is deliberately simple. Uh, in order to be accessible and easy to play for anyone to just pick up and have a bit of fun with. And that makes it pretty suitable for adaptation to home computers as a quick fire arcade experience. So let's go play Octopus. Okay, here we are with Octopus, uh, original game by Nintendo. As we say, it was a game and watch. Uh, the Atari version programmed by Lyric, a title screen by Sunar, and music and effects by Caruso. Um, I forget the real names of all those guys, but if you go and have a look on Atari Mania, uh, they've got the like the actual names of these uh, developers if you want to find out a bit more. Now, this is a very simple game because it's an adaptation of a Game & Watch, um, so this will probably be a fairly quick playthrough, um, but I think it's really cool. I think it's a really cool adaptation of the formula. So, let's take a look. Hit the fire button, and off we go. So if you've never played Octopus before, your aim is to move your little diver dude oops, to the sunken ship in the bottom right corner and go and grab the treasure without getting caught by the octopus's pointy tentacles. Now because this was a Game & Watch which was based on a... Oh, what's it called? It's a, a twisted pneumatic screen, I think it is. So the same sort of thing that makes digital watches work, where all the possible... Um, graphical elements light up a bit at a time in order to display them on the screen. Uh, so you see that as we move in this game we're not moving smoothly, we're moving between specific predefined locations. That's a simulation of how the original Game & Watch works. So just like a particular graphical element would light up on the screen to sort of simulate movement, uh, but you weren't really moving as such, you were just sort of lighting up a new thing. So you could just move between specific areas on the screen. So part of... Uh, oh, there's their real names. Okay, so programmed by Arcadius Lubashka. Hmm, that went by a bit quickly for me to read, uh, especially with my limited knowledge of Polish pronunciation. So I do apologise to uh, any of the developers who happen to be watching. They're probably not watching, but whatever. Anyway, let's have another game. So, like I say, the key thing in learning how to play this is understanding um, those different positions that you can move between. And also how the octopus itself works. So if you, so if you look, each of the octopus's tentacles is split into several different segments. Um... And it's only the last pointed one that will actually kill you if it touches you. So you have to keep an eye on its movement. And time your movements past it so that you're not... Um, ...gonna get caught by them. And the speed that each tentacle moves is quite random. So sometimes you end up having to take... Whoops! Sometimes you end up having to take your time a bit in order to get past them. But there's no time limit or anything, so you can take your time. So this is a game about patience more than anything, if you want to attain a high score. Then you can be as greedy as you want when you're taking stuff from the ship down... Oops! You can be as greedy as you want when you're taking stuff from the ship down in the corner, um, and you get a point for every bit that you take. Um, but you get three points upon your return to the ship, regardless of how much you took in the first place. So... 
taking lots of stuff from the ship is a good way to get a bunch of points, but you don't get those points twice. You get a flat three points for returning to the ship. I'm not super familiar with the original Game & Watch version of this, but I imagine that's how it works, because this seems to be a very true adaptation of um, how it all worked. In terms of things like the movement of the tentacles and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I'm really impressed with this. Um, I think this is a game that makes a very good use of the 8-bits capabilities by not trying to do too much. And because the, the graphics and the mechanics and that sort of thing are so simplistic in this game by its very nature of being an LCD handheld in the first place. Oh no! That means the game can do things like run in a reasonably high resolution um, colour graphics mode. Oh no! And have a lot of detail because it's not having to throw too much stuff around the screen at once. And so it's quick, it's responsive, it works really well. Oh! I'm struggling to get past that 40 mark, aren't I? Let's try again. But yeah, this is taking really good advantage of the Atari's capabilities. Um, working within its limitations and producing something that looks really great. This is probably one of the best looking things I've seen on the 8-bit for a long time. And it's fun and addictive. The beauty of those Game & Watch devices were that they were very enjoyable, highly addictive games. Whose handheld nature meant that you could just stick them in your pocket or a bag or something like that, pull them out when you were getting particularly bored, and just get on with it. And while booting up a home computer isn't quite as quick and easy as um, pulling a game of what? Oh no, got a bit trapped there. It's not quite as easy as pulling a game of watch out of your pocket. Um, it's still pretty quick. You stick this on like an Atari flash cartridge, or um, or just load it into an emulator or something, and you're playing right away. There's no loading breaks. There's no initialization. This is all written in machine code, so there's no like redefining character sets or anything like that. So you're just straight into playing and having some fun. A bit of classic Nintendo action on your Atari 8-bit. Can't complain about that, can you? Uh-oh, this could be bad. This could be very bad. Oh, we're good. And I break 40 this time. Yes, I've broken 40. Nice. Oh no! I walked right into that one. I am an idiot. So yeah, super impressed with this. Now, as far as I'm aware, um, the group of people who worked on this, um, what did they say they recorded it? Rsoft or something like that? Um, they've done a few adaptations like this, along with some other bits and pieces. Uh, so I think they did an adaptation of uh, the Parachute LCD game as well, so we'll have to have a look at that at some point. Um, I've already got something lined up for P for next week, so it probably won't be this time, but we'll definitely return to these at some point. Nice. Now, I know in the version of Parachute... Um, I think you can actually turn the music off and have some slightly more authentic blips and bloops um, instead of the music. So if we press... Can you do that in this one? Oh yeah, there we go. Press select during gameplay. And in fact, it's actually a little bit easier to sort of judge things that way because you'll hear that there's a noise every time the octopus's tentacles move. Which makes it a bit a bit clearer that they're actually moving regularly. 
even though some might look like they're not moving that often. That's surprising how much of a difference that makes, actually. That makes it much easier to judge things. Oh dear. He says, dying. <laughs> So obviously these aren't quite the identical sound effects that they were of the Game & Watch version. Um, because they had a very distinctive sound that was made using a sort of bleeper buzzer type thing. Uh, the Game & Watch death sound was uh, a very distinctive noise that anyone who grew up in the 80s is probably familiar with. It was this sort of this horrible snarking buzzer noise that really made it clear that you'd messed up. <laughs> I'm not doing too bad this time. I think the one thing this game is missing is uh, like a high score function. It doesn't appear to record your high score anywhere while you're playing. So you've just got to remember what your best was. And you'll see, you see, and here on this mode, as you play, the whole thing accelerates and gets faster and faster and more challenging. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. This is this is a lot of fun. I um I still have one game and watch in my collection. I still have the Mario Cement Factory game and watch that I grew up with. That is a great game. I wonder if uh, I wonder if this company of uh, well this group of people I should say they're not really a company as such. Um, I wonder if these guys have done a version of Mario Cement Factory because that that's a great little game. Um, it sort of takes the standard Game Watch formula of move to a location without getting hit by something and adds a few extra interesting little mechanics on top of that. Oh, that tentacle was right in the way. And yeah, it's a really enjoyable game that uh, would be ripe for adaptation like this. These Game & Watch games have actually been sort of adapted quite widely to different systems. Like the, the Game Boy and the Nintendo DS, I think, have both had uh, sort of Game & Watch gallery releases on them. That allow you to play these um, experiences on a modern platform without having to buy a dedicated handheld just for one game. Which, of course, was the only real downside of the Game & Watches is that it wasn't a system that you were buying cartridges for to get wasn't a system that you're buying cartridges for to get new games for. You had to buy a whole new handheld for each game because of the very nature of the way they, they worked. Um, but that did mean they had a nice sort of cool collectible element to them. And if you had a bunch of them, you could sort of display them. They all had little stands on the back so you could stand them up. They all worked as alarm clocks as well, hence the and watch part of the, uh, of the thing because they, they all had a clock and an alarm on them. So obviously this version lacks the clock function because the Atari 8-bit doesn't have um, like an internal clock or anything like that. But I mean, what, what would be the point of that, really? Do you have your Atari 8-bit by your bed ready to wake you up in the morning? I certainly do not. I'm sure someone does, though. Someone has probably written some sort of machine code routine to uh, get their Atari to drive their coffee machine or something like that. That's one quite fond memory I have of um, the old Atari magazines, actually. I think sort of Atari user in particular was very fond of um, including sections on, I think they, they tended to call it like their gadget section. And those sections were often sort of how to make your Atari do things that you wouldn't expected to do i think i've talked about this a couple of times before but sort of back in the days when the atari 8-bit was current a lot of the magazines i say a lot of the magazines there were sort of really two in this country and sort of two big ones on the states as well um one of the things that writers for those magazines and, and the editors in particular like to make a big point of was the fact that computers were not just for gaming they wanted to distinguish the Atari 8-bit computers from computers from the uh, Atari 2600, uh, despite that being called the video computer system. The Atari 2600 was very much a game system, but sort of the big distinguishing factor for the Atari 8-bit computers was that um, 
you could do more than just play games on them. You had a built-in basic interpreter so you could learn to program um, with the appropriate software and experience. You could learn to use things like assembly language and various other programs to um, to develop high-speed machine code programs. And one of the things that um, Atari user in particular liked to sort of promote was the use of the Atari 8-bit as a kind of central controlling device for lots of other devices in your home. So it was sort of a very early incarnation of sort of smart home technology in a lot of ways. It was sort of like, here's how you can hook up your Atari to like control a light switch on a timer or something like that, or how you can build your own uh, speech synthesis module, or how you can turn your Atari into like a musical instrument and that sort of thing. They were always really fascinating to read back at the time, even if you had no intention of actually following through on the projects that they provided. But it's even more fascinating to look back at these from a modern perspective and just see what users were encouraged to be getting up to with their home computers. I mean, if you think of like a PC magazine these days, outside of sort of very specialist magazines that are specifically about programming or game development or whatever it's pretty rare that you get sort of a, a platform specific magazine that is encouraging you to use the system for things other than games so like all the big surviving pc magazines are like pc gamer and stuff like that so they focus very much on the gaming side of things and yes some of them do talk about like building your own pc and that sort of thing but ultimately that's all in the service of just getting your games to look and perform better so i think that's that's kind of an aspect of computing culture that we've we've lost a bit along the way i mean yes there are still websites and oops there are still websites and tutorials out there that will teach you how to do various things but sort of the mainstream attitude that you should be using your computer for more than games is um i don't know it doesn't feel quite the same as it was back in the day right let's have a couple more goes on this as so i've uh, rambled on about things that aren't this game for quite long enough one point beautiful this definitely isn't going to be the last one then <laughs> give me the treasure Yeah, these Game & Watch games are sort of really fascinating examples of game design, and they were put together by a real sort of master. It was uh, Gunpei Yokoi, who um, ended up designing the Game Boy as well, and was uh, tragically lost well before his time, but he had a massive influence on um, a lot of the gaming industry, and particularly a lot of Nintendo's output. A lot of his dis distinctive attitude to game design and that sort of thing still persists in um, a lot of games today. Particularly from Nintendo. Alright, let's make this the last one then. Not a good start. Oh, this is a terrible start. Maybe this won't be the last one, because this is pathetic performance from me. I can say with some confidence that this octopus would have probably freaked me out as a kid, just because the, the sort of tentacles with the spikes on the end of them. I would have found that quite upsetting as a kid. <laughs> As I'm already not a big fan of things that have too many legs. And if you add spikes to the end of them... Well, no one's going to have a good time at all then, are they? I think a good strategy to try and follow in this game is to spot where the safe spot is. Because you might notice that the top leg has two possible positions it can move to. So 
there's always one space that is safe. It's either this one just below the boat or this one here. And it all depends on which direction that first tentacle is moving. And if you can get to it, of course. Oh no! One more try. One more try. One more try. Alright, bring it on, Octopus. I got you this time. I say, it's a game all about patience. And being willing to wait for a suitable opening. And then getting out of there, rather than getting too greedy. And also keeping an eye on the movement of the tentacles as well, making sure you know which direction they're moving in. Because they, because they always come all the way out and then all the way back in again. So that can help you to understand which places are safe, or safer anyway. So while that last tentacle is moving in, you've got a lot of time to grab a bunch of treasure. Nice. Oh. But sometimes you see those tentacles do move quite quickly because it's random which one of the four moves with each tick in the background. So you have to be very careful. Maybe one more try. I've broken 60 a couple of times. Let's see if I can get, like, more than 60. Not a bad start. Which way are you going? Time it nicely. There we go. Oh, we're getting a good rhythm going this time. Nearly at 50. Oh no! Idiocy. I walked right into that one. Like a complete moron. Oh, it's getting quick. Yeah, much less time to grab stuff. There we are, there's 60. I'm, I'm satisfied now. So if it's all over now. Oh no! One more life. Run, little diver, run! Yeah, the speed these games run at. Ah, oh, 69 to finish with. It's the meme number. What a way to finish, eh? Yeah, these games get really quick as you progress and like that's very authentic to the original handhelds as well like this this isn't just like the computer version being quick that was the original handheld versions would have gone that quickly as well um so you'd, you'd really have to sort of test your reactions in a lot of cases but anyway that was octopus i really like that that's super cool so i'm gonna have to make a point of checking out uh, some more of their other stuff like i say i know that these guys have done a version of parachute as well um P is next week uh, but i already have something lined up for that so um maybe next time around if i remember we'll try and check out parachute uh, from these guys in the meantime you could always check it out yourself as well go and have a look on atari mania and there's a link to download um their various games there as well to run on an emulator or transfer into a flashcard anyway as always thank you very much for watching and i'll see you again next time Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects moegamer.net where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today and videopackgames.wordpress.com which aims to catalogue the small but well formed library of the Philips G7000 video pack computer also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Thank you.